Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening, and thank you for coming to Rice University's Baker Institute. Uh, I'm John Diamond. I'm the director of the Center for Public Finance. I'm delighted. We have a wonderful speaker, Dr. William Gale. Uh, the Center for Public Finance is hosting its third book forum. Uh, our first two forums have included uh, Professor Robert Gordon. Uh, he, he discussed his book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, and Professor Alan Blinder, who discussed his book, Advi Advice and Dissent. Tonight we are hosting another world-renowned speaker in Dr. William Gale, so we're very excited about that, and thank you for coming, and I want to thank all of y'all for coming. I think we're in for a very interesting, yet slightly depressing at times, <laughs> conversation. Uh, Dr. Gale is the R.J. and Francis Miller Chair in Federal Economic Policy in the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. His research focuses on tax policy, fiscal policy, pensions, and savings behavior. He's co-director of the Tax Policy Center in D.C., which is a joint venture between the Brookings Institution and the Urban Institute. He's also director of the Retirement Security Project in D.C. From 2006 to 2009, he served as the vice president of Brookings and director of the Economic Studies Program. He attended Duke University and the London School of Economics and received his PhD from Stanford University. He's the author of the book he will discuss tonight, Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt Addiction and Investing in the Future. And I don't wanna take any more time, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bill and he, you've got him for the rest of the night. So thank you again for coming and here's Bill Gell. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation from uh, John. I want to thank Laura Hosey for her work uh, getting this all set up. Uh, I will say um, that the first reaction people have when they hear the book is, oh, that's a great title. And then I say, well, my wife thought of it. <laughs> and then they say, the, wait, the, oh, wait, the cover's gone, but people really like the cover. And they say, well, you know, Oxford designed that. I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> and uh, uh, then they say, well, it's really well written. And I say, well, I had an editor. <laughs> and so they're like, well, <laughs> what did you actually do? And, uh, uh, you know, if you've ever written a book, you know, sometimes you wonder, like, what, what sort of uh, uh, every, everything and nothing. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it was uh, writing a book is a labor of love. And um, uh, one of the things they – if you read a book about writing a book, one of the things they tell you to do is get to the bottom line fast. Don't make the reader wait. Uh, don't make them guess. Don't hide the ball, et cetera. So uh, here in one slide is, uh, is the entire book project. <laughs> All right. uh, and basically, I argue that we face two, uh, two situations that are closely related. Uh, I started out the writing the book about the debt problem, the federal debt, federal debt rising over time, uh, that'll have the effect of uh, uh, constraining the economy, reducing the growth of living standards, uh, limiting politicians' willingness to enact new solutions uh, for fear that they cost too much, and uh, it could even affect our global status as, as, as a world leader. So that's what I started with, then I realized that you can't just change the debt path. You can't just say we're on a lower debt path. You have, to, you have to actually change some tax policy or change some spending policy to, to achieve that goal. So then I started looking at the way we tax and spend, and uh, there, are, there are concerns all over the place here. Uh, whereas the debt concerns the level of spending versus the level of taxes, uh, the way we tax and spend concerns the composition and structure of our taxes and our spending. So on the spending side, uh, and I'll show you more on this, we're, we're basically not investing in the future. Uh, on the tax side, we're taxing in ways that are inefficient and I inequitable. And we not only need to fix those, but fixing the debt gives us the opportunity 
to fix those. So there, these we'll switch back and forth between these two issues um, uh, throughout the talk. Uh, then I came up with a, the first the first half of the book basically lays out why these are concerns. The second half offers a solution. Uh, I don't like books that are all solution and don't lay out what the problems are. And I really dislike books that spend 300 pages on the problem and then like five pages on the solution. Because solutions are always more complicated, uh, always raise more issues than you think of to begin with. So uh, the book is split roughly half and half between laying out the concerns and then laying out a solution. So I've got three parts in the solution. The first part is, is controlling entitlements. That's Washington speak for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, these things are growing uh, significantly faster than the economy. Uh, and uh, we don't want to kill these programs. We don't need to kill Social Security to save it. Uh, but we do need to reform it. The same with Medicare, Medicaid. These, these uh, initiatives uh, are vital in uh, providing health care, preventing poverty, uh, providing financial security. We don't want to take that away, uh, but, but spending on these is a little out of control. The second thing we do, uh, the second thing I do is uh, actually counter to the debt concern, and that is, I argue, we need a major new national investment agenda uh, in children's education, uh, human capital, by which I mean post-secondary education, uh, infrastructure and uh, research and development. I'll just tell you my favorite infrastructure anecdote right now. The infrastructure in the U.S. is so bad that in 20 cities, Domino's Pizza has given money to the local government earmarked to financing their paving over potholes in the road so that their drivers can deliver pizza to your doorstep, right? It can't possibly be the case that in the world's greatest economy, uh, we need to depend on dominoes, right? To, <laughs> to, uh, it's bad enough we depend on them for pizza. Uh, we certainly <laughs> shouldn't depend on them for, for pothole repair. And then the third item, which is uh, uh, necessary, is we need to raise taxes. There's simply no way around it if you look at the numbers. We can't finance this all on the spending side. We need to raise taxes, we need to raise revenues, and we need to do it uh, in a way that recognizes the changes in the economy, and that means largely uh, uh, carbon tax and high income health. And I'll talk about, uh, uh, those are two separate things, not a carbon tax on high income health. <laughs> uh, so let me, let me talk through all that, and let's start at the very beginning. Uh, the federal debt picture is scaled here by the size of the economy, GDP, or output. Uh, was pretty simple until about 1980. Uh, we, only had, we only had increases in debt during wars or depressions. When the war ended, when the depression ended, uh, the debt got paid down and recovered. So you, you can see increasing peaks at the Civil War, World War I, World War II. Uh, and then we had this long kind of golden era through about 1980. Uh, then that changed slightly. When uh, Ronald Reagan came in, he cut taxes, boosted military spending. That caused our first increase in debt in, war, in, in peacetime uh, prosperity. Uh, lawmakers got very agitated about that, enacted a whole sequence of bipartisan reforms, got the debt back down, uh, was a strong economy in the 1990s, got the debts back down to, to the mid-30s. Uh, and then uh, President Bush's tax cuts, uh, the creation of Medicare uh, uh, pharmaceutical benefit, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Great Recession, uh, so on, uh, sent debt back up. And our current level now is 79%. That's the highest ratio to the economy in our history, except for a few years around the Second World War. All right, and we know why. We know why we had a lot of debt at the end of the Second World War, and and. I don't think anyone would say that that was a poor use of debt. But now we're rising, we've got debt rising, and the question, the question ultimately is what, I, what are we getting for it, um, which I'll come to in a second. And then, so if you look forward, this is a forecast that I've done, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, other people have done a variety of the same things. And there's two, there's, there's two things really to note about, about this. One is obviously the debt is rising to higher levels. 
than it's ever been in the past. Uh, we're on a path to do that. But the other thing, uh, maybe even the more important thing, is that this is permanent. There's, there's no war that's going to end that's going to turn this path back down. There's no recovery in the economy that's going to boost revenues and turn this path back down. We've got this more or less permanent imbalance between taxes and spending at this point. And um, that's only going to get worse, which is why this number uh, keeps going up. And nothing, nothing good happens after 2049 either. It just uh, 30 years seems long enough to, to get the general <laughs> picture. Okay, uh, I w let, me, let, me, let me interject here. I am not a gloom and doomer. Okay, uh, uh, I think these are solvable uh, problems and I present a solution uh, and I don't think it's a crisis, but it is something we need to pay attention to. So, so uh, I'm, I'm glass half full on, on most of this stuff. Um, oh, sorry. So if you look at this, a lot of times people say, well, you know, that's 30 years out. Uh, life is uncertain. A lot can happen in 30 years. I don't really want to believe anything that's only true 30 years from now. And the response to that is it's true right now. Uh, even, with, even with the economy booming, uh, uh, with unemployment at a 60-year low, we're, we've got deficits in the range of 4 or 5% of GDP. And again, uh, the full employment deficit is controls for the state of the economy. Uh, and in the past, you can see it, it spiked at various times. It, it peaked in the 2009 uh, era. We've never had an era of permanent high full employment deficits. That's what we're headed toward, though. We've got, again, this permanent structural imbalance. And you can, so you can see that here. You don't have to wait um, for 30 years to get that data. All right, so what's causing this debt increase? All right, I, uh, I really like this chart. This is my favorite, single favorite chart in the whole, in the whole um, uh, effort because it, it, it basically lets you be the expert, okay? What you see in this chart will tell you basically what you want to do to solve this problem. So one approach is to say, well, spending is rising, going from 28% to 27.9%. Therefore, it's a spending issue. Therefore, we should cut spending. All right, that's not my view, but that is a well-formulated, internally logical view, uh, internally consistent view. I have two concerns with that view. The first is a lot of the increase in spending is net interest, which is not any programmatic feature of the government. It's simply a reflection of the past that, that a reflection of the fact that we had deficits in the past, and now we have to pay interest on that debt. So there's no particular reason why that militates towards spending cuts versus tax increases. The other, uh, the rest of the increase, in fact, more than 100% of the rest of the increase, is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And the reason that's important is that these are commitments the government made decades ago. And uh, this is not a new expansion of government. This is simply the playing out of the fact that government made these commitments decades ago, and now there are more elderly people and they're living longer, and healthcare is more expensive. So um, the increase in spending here is not representing any new initiative of government. It's simply the fact that uh, uh, with more, given our demographic shift, the increase in the elderly, uh, and given the things that the federal government does, we're going to have to spend more, more, uh, more money. All right, so the other argument is that uh, it's a tax problem. Taxes are too low. They're actually below their historical average. Uh, uh, and then uh, the third approach would be to say, well, it's an imbalance issue. And I think that's the fairest way to say it. we want more from government than we're willing to pay. And now we're, we're seeing the, the outcome of that. All right, one more chart. I'll just show you, this is the composition of government spending. I mentioned that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are more than, a, and, and, and net interest are more than 100% of the increase. And you can see they're all going up dramatically. Uh, uh, what, what's going down uh, is non-defense discretionary spending, which is a fancy way of saying education, infrastructure, uh, science, research and development. Uh, all the kind of the investment functions, housing, uh, energy assistance. Uh, what's also going down is 
uh, military spending, which is not crazy because uh, you can, you know, if you, ha if you increase the population by 5%, you can defend that population with the same military uh, institutions. But defense is going down. And then other mandatory, which is a fancy way of saying the social safety net. So food stamps, unemployment insurance, uh, TANF, which is a successor to welfare, uh, things like that are falling as a share of GDP. So this picture links the issues about the way we spend with, with the debt issue, all right? This is not a picture. If, if you were to design uh, a s from, you know, from scratch uh, government spending, what should the government spend money on? You would probably want it investing more uh, in kids, in the infrastructure, in the environment, in research, uh, uh, in providing the things that the, public, that the private sector is not good at uh, or where it can supplement or help the private sector. Uh, instead, those functions are going down. Uh, spending on health care and social security uh, uh, is going up. And uh, this is not, uh, I mean, I understand why this is happening, and I, I'm a strong defender of Social Security and Medicare, but this is not a picture of like a healthy portrait of what's going to happen to government spending. All right. Um, so we've got, so far we've just showed you pictures. Uh, debt's going up, spending is going up, composition of spending is shifting toward the elderly and net interest, and uh, then the question is who cares? What's the effect of all this? So we're going to slight detour into economics here. Uh, first thing, again, in the, in the not a doom and gloomer category, I want to emphasize that not all debt is bad, right? Just like a household might take out a mortgage to buy a house or take out a loan to start a business, uh, there are good uses and bad uses of debt. And the problem, in a nutshell, is we're generating bad debt, okay? Uh, so... Um, uh, financing investment uh, is reasonable if you're going to generate, if you're going to do something to generate returns over time, that you do something that, that where you, you pay the cost back over time too. Uh, fighting a recession uh, is, is, uh, is a particularly important uh, uh, aspect of government. When a recession hits, businesses cut back because consumers are not spending, consumers stop spending because businesses stop hiring them. And you can get in this vicious circle where the economy moves moves down. The government can interject itself in that circle with basically putting money in people's pockets uh, and getting the economy going again. So the classic classic stimulus. Uh, so those are all reasonable uses of debt. Uh, financing a war, a necessary war, is obviously another reasonable use. Uh, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is we're financing current tr transfers with debt. So it's the equivalent of like taking a vacation and putting on your credit card and, and figuring you'll pay for it someday in the future. Um, so um, I just spoke to some uh, very engaged and intelligent students about an hour ago and uh, I was able to bring up my own freshman English class courses, the Hemingway novel, Sun Also Rises. One of the characters asked the other, how did, how did you go bankrupt? The other one says two ways, uh, gradually and then suddenly. And that's, uh, that's a perfect description of what debt can do to the economy. Okay, now I want to take these in the reverse order because I want to take the sudden part off the, the agenda. But let me, let me just explain that. The sudden scenario is something happens that causes investors to run. And they leave, interest rates spike, the dollar drops, economy goes into recession. Uh, in the, uh, the Reese example, it was revealed that the government had cooked its books. They changed advisors, and the new advisor revealed that the old advisor had cooked the books. And investors said, this is crazy, I'm out of here. And the economy went, Greece went in deep recession, uh, uh, and they're still suffering from it. Uh, that's not going to happen to us. We are the safest currency in the world. Uh, uh, we, we issue our own currency. We borrow in our own currency. Uh, uh, we, if you look at our numbers, we can pay our debt for decades. It's just, it's just not an issue. 
uh, the fact that interest rates are low right now, even though debt has gone up, indicates that markets don't think this is a crisis uh, situation. Uh, policymakers could induce a crisis if, for example, they didn't raise the debt limit when we needed to raise the debt limit. But in terms of the basic economics, I don't see a crisis on the horizon. I'd say for the foreseeable future, but we know that that means like a week or a, a <laughs> couple of days uh, these days. But my point is even if there's not a crisis, there's still a problem, all right? And that, that's the, this is the hard part to convey when you have uh, you know, a 15 second CNN soundbite. Because you have to say this first, anything that has, that has a but in it is, is too late. You've already lost the debate. Uh, so the, my colleague Charlie Schultz, who um, uh, ran the Office of Budget and was the President Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, back in the Carter administration, has this great quote that deficits are the termites in the woodwork, not the wolf at the door. And what he meant was they will gradually eat away at the capital stock, gradually eat away at our future growth uh, prospects, but they won't cause this huge uh, you know, pyrotechnic uh, crisis. And so this can happen in two ways. Uh, either borrowing more creates higher interest rates or borrowing more creates capital inflows. Uh, uh, either way, once we've borrowed more for a uh, non-investment purpose, like once the government borrows and essentially spends it on consumption, uh, national saving has gone down. That is, the, the amount the whole country saves gone, has gone down because people, for example, suppose the government gives a dollar tax cut. Uh, people don't save the whole dollar. They save some of it. They spend some of it. So public saving goes down by a dollar. Uh, private saving goes up by, say, 10 cents, and national saving goes down by 90 cents. Once that happens, future national income will go down, just like the household saves less now their income in the future will, will go down. Uh, whether that happens through higher interest rates or, or more capital flows uh, depends on a lot of situations, but there's a lot of evidence on this. There's an enormous literature that deficits reduce growth, reduce investment, raise interest rates, uh, raise exchange rates, cause capital inflows, et cetera. All right, I, I, can't, I can't go through it now and you don't want me to go through it. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. So that's the concern. That's the straight economic concern with debt, is that it's going to reduce economic growth. Uh, a more colloquial way to say it is reduce the growth of living standards for people. Uh, uh, the political concern, as I mentioned before, is if there's this big debt hanging over Washington, political leaders will be less willing to use tools of government to deal with whatever uh, issues come up. This is, issue is called fiscal space which is a little bit nebulous, but the idea is uh, if the government's finances were sound, there might be more willingness to undertake new initiatives. If the government's finances are weak, uh, there's both a legitimate concern about undertaking new initiatives because their finances are weak, but also there's the political talking point that anything you oppose, you just say, oh, well, the deficit's too high, I, you know, we can't do it. Uh, so um, there's an economic dimension to this, but there's also a political dimension to this. So the question then is what, what, uh, what's the right debt target? I basically argued that 177% is the wrong debt target. Uh, I, that I argue in the book for a 60% of GDP debt target, which is slightly lower today than today. I'll, I've amended that in recent work to say if interest rates stay low, I think we could go to 100% uh, of GDP in terms of debt, as long as interest rates uh, stay low. But let me, be before I give you the actual numbers, let me just m mention uh, low interest rates help the debt picture a lot because the government's a borrower, lower interest rates on net are going to help. If you're a borrower, you want lower, lower interest rates. Uh, but the fact that the baseline is so high, uh, uh, means that cuts down to a level like 100 or 60 could, could be quite painful. They're quite substantial cuts. Um, on the other hand, the argument for containing debt, that is for cutting it a lot, one is this growth 
argument that I, that I just mentioned. And the second is it's unclear how be much better off future generations will be. Usually the argument with debt is, well, we're going to impose debt on future generations, but we're giving them a better economy and a better life, and so it's okay if they bear more of the burden. All right? Uh, the issue, though, is the economic turbulence of the last 20, 30 years has left m many members of younger generations worse off than their parents were. So this graph is from a paper that an economist named Raj Shetty at Harvard wrote with some of his colleagues. It basically shows uh, among people born in 1940, about 90% of them are better off as young adults than their parents were. That is, they have more absolute, more real income, more inflation-adjusted income. By the time you get to 1980, only about half are uh, better off than their parents were. Uh, and um, the, the argument is that although the economy's been growing, the income distribution has widened too. So you get more kind of variation within a family, and some kids are coming in under where their parents uh, were. I've done some work on housing and wealth accumulation across generations, and you see the same thing. I mean, it's, it's legendary that millennials are not buying houses. If you look at home ownership rates among 25 to 35-year-olds, they've gone way down uh, the last 10, 20 years. And the same thing is true of wealth, uh, uh, wealth accumulation overall. They s uh, simply accumulate less. Now, the argument is, uh, so student loans are part of this, but, but not as big as people think. Uh, because credit card debt among millennials is much lower than it was in previous generations. So uh, the student loan stuff gets all the headlines, but it's really a wealth accumulation story. They're simply accumulating less wealth. Part of that is because they came into the labor market during a Great Recession. The recessions are really bad. They have long scarring effects on people's earning uh, history. Uh, but there's a concern about how much better off future generations will be and therefore how much we should pass along uh, to them. Okay. So uh, I apologize for this. The numbers in the right column here are wrong. They were the old version of the paper. I did not get them updated correctly. The number to, the number to look at is the, the number that's 4.4. It should be 2.8. Okay, and let me just talk about that example. That says if we started in 2025, that is give policymakers a lot of lead time, and we wanted to get the debt to GDP ratio down to 100% of GDP by 2049, uh, again, we would, that 4.4 should be 2.8. We would need tax increases or spending cuts of 2.8% of GDP starting in 2025 going forward. All right, that's about $560 billion per year uh, in current terms, uh, which is far larger than anything that's on the table. The tax cut in 2017, for example, is on the order of $200 billion a year, and that was a cut. This is an increase we're, we're talking about. So, um, uh, again, I'm sorry for the old numbers, but the, the – and, and don't think that they're crazy unstable, like it goes from 4.4 to 2.8. I changed the order of the rows and then I forgot to change the order of the numbers, so it, it, anyway. anyway. Uh, uh, but 2.8 percent is, is, is what you can think about as, as a sizable increase. Uh, now, usually when people hear that, they start squirming and they say, well, what if we did this, what if we did that, okay? Uh, we cannot get there by cutting foreign aid. Uh, people think foreign aid is a huge part of the budget. It's actually less than 1 percent of the budget. Uh, there are polls that something like 40% of the population thinks we spend more on foreign aid than Social Security. Uh, we actually spend more on Social Security in two weeks than we do in foreign aid in the whole year. But there's a variety of things. People talk about, well, I'm going to eliminate the Department of Commerce or the Department of Education or I'm going to cut funding for uh, Big Bird or something like that. Uh, this is just peanuts, right? The, the uh, sorry, that was a, I didn't mean for that to be. <laughs> Uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are the big players here. Those three and defense and net interest are basically 70% of all government spending. Uh, we can't really cut defense very much. It, it's come way, way down from what it was uh, historically. Net interest uh, 
cutting that is defaulting. That's what we're trying to avoid. So that means we really need to focus on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. There, I mean, that's where the money is. We can, of course, find savings elsewhere, uh, but, but we really have to go after those uh, spending levels uh, there. Inflation, I'll talk about this if somebody wants. There, there's a concern that inflation, that policymakers seeing debt will simply inflate the currency. Uh, that actually won't work in this case. I can explain why if, if people want. Uh, tax cuts, uh, there's sometimes arguments that broad-based tax cuts will raise revenues. Uh, they won't. Uh, we've seen that repeatedly. Uh, we cannot tax cut our way to uh, fiscal responsibility. And then economic growth, which everyone's in favor of, uh, uh, will help, no question. But it helps less than you think or not you, but one might think. Um, uh, CBO showed that uh, very sizable increases in the productivity rate uh, make very small dents in the long-term uh, debt. And the reason is a little perverse, is if, if productivity goes up, wages go up, so then Social Security benefits go up. So, so there's a little, there's kind of a feedback mechanism there that dampen. Oh, the other thing is interest rates go up if the growth rate goes up. So there are two, these two feedback mechanisms that dampen the impact of growth on on solving uh, the fiscal situation. All right. So I'm going to give you a very extremely brief tour of what I think we should do. Uh, healthcare, uh, we need to expand the coverage expand coverage and get everybody covered. It, it, I think that it's crazy that in this country you can be one medical injury away from bankruptcy, right? Wow. I just, I don't want to, I don't want my society to live, to be that way. I want people to have health coverage. Uh, uh, then we, the big issue here though is controlling costs. Uh, we can introduce competition in Medicare, more competition in Medicare. Uh, we can provide provider payment reform, which is essentially paying doctors, hospitals for outcomes rather than input. Uh, and uh, there's this issue that just drives me nuts, which is that Medicare pays way more for the same uh, pharmaceuticals that Medicaid and the Veteran Administration does. And there's basically half a billion, half a trillion dollars in savings over 10 years from having uh, Medicare pay what Medicaid and VA pay. Uh, and I understand the arguments that drug companies need incentive, but I do not understand why Medicare has to pay more than Medicaid and VA. So there's a lot of money to be saved there. Social Security, I was on a commission a couple years ago with a bipartisan policy center, a, a great think tank in Washington. Uh, we came up with a plan uh, that it's pretty similar to most other plans. It would gradually raise the full retirement age, would change the way inflation is calculated. Uh, it would make annual benefits more progressive. That is, it would tilt uh, the benefit structure. So it would essentially boost the minimum benefit, which you have to do if you're thinking of raising retirement age. And it would uh, reduce the upper, uh, the upper benefit. And then it would have to, we'd have to raise payroll taxes uh, to make to make it balanced. So that's Social Security. Uh, on investing in the future, I propose that we invest 1% of GDP, which would be about $200 billion a year, in a wide range of social policy stuff. This is basically using the government to invest uh, in people, whether it's kids or child care options to get women in the w staying in the workforce. Um, Oh, this notion of patching current holes in the safety net and raising take-up rates is one of the things I learned that I was stunned by. Uh, most of the major programs like um, uh, TANF, uh, energy assistance, housing assistance, have take-up rates about 20%, 25 maybe. So one in four, one in five people who are eligible for these things are actually getting the benefits. So if we could actually just get the benefits to the people who are eligible for them, uh, we could make a big dent uh, in poverty and in, uh, in opportunity. And then infrastructure and um, R&D, uh, I go through this in the book, net federal investment in infrastructure has been almost zero 
the last 25 years. Uh, in the 1990s, for example, when uh, President Clinton and the Republicans came up with all these budget savings, uh, what they did was basically cut out investment. And since then, uh, infrastructure, crazy as it seems, that was 25 years ago, uh, uh, infrastructure investment has been very low since then. R&D investment has been very low. And we can, we get a big bang for the buck for this stuff. So I, I would like to see us invest there. <laughs> All right, on the tax side, I will be uh, quick. Uh, I, I think there's no substitute for a carbon tax right now. We, we need the revenues, but more importantly, we need policy directed toward climate change. Uh, I propose a value-added tax, which is basically a national sales tax that uh, the offsets mean there's a, we take care of low-income households in this, uh, but a 10% rate, a VAT, uh, the, the VAT is the big driver of the revenue increases in the model. A 10% consumption tax generates a lot of money. Uh, 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 then the business taxes, there are various details. Income taxes, there are various details. Uh, uh, I will mention that I think the mortgage interest deduction is a bad policy. Uh, we could get much more benefit from home ownership by converting it to a first-time home buyer uh, subsidy. Uh, and then let me mention this last thing, IRS funding and enforcement. I did not emphasize this enough in the book. Since I turned in the book, I've been doing a lot of research on this. And the tax gap in this country is $600 billion a year. There's $600 billion, 3% of GDP, that's owed in taxes every year that's not paid, all right? And this is like one, uh, one out of every six, sorry, for every, for every six dollars of tax revenue that's paid, there's one dollar that's not paid, right? And that's an enormous, enormous number. And uh, of course, you need more funding for the IRS to be able to do this, but uh, this is, even uh, every administration that looked at this suggests you get you know, four to one payoff, six to one payoff, eight to one payoff. Um, everything about this is bad. The uh, IRS is losing its experts because people are retiring and nobody's going into the IRS. Uh, audit rates have collapsed. Uh, uh, there's a, I think there's a really room for a first order uh, effort here. All right, uh, so what would happen if, if we did all this, everything I said? This is the same graph before with those three lines, the, the fiscal Rorschach test with the deficit at the bottom. All right, so what I propose for spending is basically it goes up a little, but non-interest spending ends up staying the way, essentially where it is. And that's a cut in Social Security uh, and health spending combined with the increase in infrastructure and investment in kids. So it basically levels out. Um, total spending, though, falls a lot. Uh, in my plan uh, relative to what it would have been. And that's because interest payments go down. And the reason interest payments go down is because revenues go up. So starting in 2021, we get the phase in value added tax and uh, there's a big increase in revenues. You can see now uh, at the end of the period, uh, it turns out that we're almost at a zero deficit. Right? I was not aiming for a balanced budget balanced budget is economically meaningless, uh, but it actually gets pretty close to, um, let me be clear, it might be politically very important, but in terms of economics, uh, what you want to do is stabilize the debt to GDP ratio over time. If GDP is growing, then, then you can have deficits and still stabilize the debt. Okay, so it, it's not helpful in economic terms, especially given the way the government defines things, uh, but it might be a very politically important mile, uh, you know, target. Like policymakers, you know, may be willing to fall in their store to get a balanced budget, whereas they may not be willing to do that to get a hundred billion dollar deficit or something like that. All right. So, uh, and then this is what happens to the debt. Uh, I aimed for 60. Uh, it turned out to be 52. Uh, I didn't then go back and change everything back because as I mentioned earlier, this is 30 years from now. Uh, there's going to be a range of, uh, uh, you know, uncertainty surrounding. But, and if you told me the right target was 80 instead of 60, I could not prove that you were wrong. So th it, there's a judgment involved here uh, as, well as, as well as the economic reality. 
Okay, so what would be the effects of this plan? I think it would raise uh, economic growth for several reasons. First, the lower debt will free up capital. The corporate tax changes, which I didn't talk about, could be very powerful in stimulating investment. Uh, increased investment in infrastructure, R&D, kids uh, have to help. Uh, I think it would reduce inequality and increase economic mobility. Uh, there's a long chapter in the book about the causes and effects of uh, inequality and the key role of mobility. And then I want to emphasize, I, I want to pat myself on the back here. This is an honest plan. There are no magic asterisks. Uh, I did not fudge the estimates. Uh, the reforms are actually realistic, administrable reforms. There's always, uh, uh, every social problem has some incredibly elegant solution that has never existed anywhere in the world and works great on paper but would never work in the real world. And I've tried to avoid those. I've tried to basically pull items off the shelf. Uh, so someone say, someone w you may say, well, there's no radical uh, proposals in here. And I would say, yes, that's intended. All right, I, I didn't want to end up with having a debate about whether the wealth tax is constitutional, uh, whether the universal basic income makes sense. Uh, my view is we can get there from here with reasonably uh, moderate changes. Uh, I'm not against talking about big policy ideas. I like talking about big policy ideas, but I didn't want the discussion to get uh, uh, diverted by that. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, <laughs> let me just say, I, I can be quick. We talk about conservatives, liberals, and politics. Uh, the typical cr conservative critique of this plan is there are too many taxes, all right, and that's going to kill the economy. And I'm here to tell you that that's not going to happen. Uh, this graph shows you tax revenues in three different periods in the U.S. before World War I on the left, after World War II on the right, and in the middle, in the middle. And taxes went up from under 3% to over 17% from the pre-World War I period to the post-World War II period. This is of the economy. This is 15% of GDP. Remember I said the fiscal gap was 2.8% of GDP and the uh, tax cut was basically 1% of GDP. So these are enormous changes. It's 15 percentage points of GDP. And per capita growth uh, is basically the same in all these periods. Okay? If you added in state and local taxes, you'd have an even steeper uh, increase. But you don't see that showing up in uh, per capita growth. Now you might say, well, you know, before World War I was a long time ago. So let's look at cross-country evidence. Uh, this is the U.S. and the rest of the G7. Their taxes are about a third higher than ours, the 33 instead of 25. This is from since 1970, and, uh, uh, but a per capita growth rate in here and the rest of G7 has been about the same since then. So uh, I don't mean this to say that taxes have no effect on growth, because uh, obviously they do, but it helps put in perspective uh, the debates we have in Washington about essentially whether the, the, the debate about whether the top rate should be 39.6 or 37.0, for example, is silly compared to a graph that shows that if you raise taxes by 15% of GDP, you don't impact um, the growth rate. All right. Now, the liberal concern is, well, interest rates are low, and that helps, of course, but the response is you know, sort of like if essentially a, we, we have a gamble we should take. So the liberal response is we don't need to worry about the deficit. We should just spend and we don't need to worry about that because interest rates are low. And uh, it's true that interest rates help the fiscal picture, as I mentioned, but uh, you know, interest rates may not stay low. And if we do all this borrowing and then interest rates go up, then we're doubly screwed because we've got a lot of debt and high interest rates. And I'll just mention uh, low interest rates make it harder to prefund Social Security and Medicare. I won't go into that, but that's, that's, um, that's a concern. All right, so let me skip this and just go to the politics. Um, as cheery and optimistic as the politics are, as the economics are, the politics are somewhat depressing. Uh, 
uh, this is a guy named Mansur Olson, a University of Maryland professor, who laid out this idea that when you have a policy that helps a lot of people a little bit, but hurts a few people a lot, that those few people will organize and kill the policy. Okay, and so, for example, uh, environment something that improved environmental quality generally, but imposed big taxes on a very small sector, uh, would be vociferously opposed by that small sector and would be likely to die. The deficit, the fiscal policy is a perfect example of that. The benefits are off in the future. They're kind of squishy, you know, more growth, uh, higher living standards. You can't really see which part of your living standard is due to the debt and which part isn't. Uh, but the benefits are very obvious. Uh, 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 somebody's taxes have to go up. Somebody's benefits have to, have to come down. So Charlie Schultz, my colleague, uh, who I mentioned earlier, had something that he called the Hippocratic Oath for politicians, which is never be seen to do obvious harm. <laughs> and this is, this is a situation where politicians would violate that, that, that oath. I'll just mention a couple other things. It's hard to do things in our form of government. Uh, in the United Kingdom, in European countries, the majority comes in in parliament, they implement their agenda. I mean, I kind of laugh when the new party comes in in the UK, well, uh, 10 years ago in the UK, not, not now. But they would come in and say, here are the new policies. You know, and in the US, the president sends the budget up to Congress and Congress says it's dead on arrival. And, and you, have to, you have to get a lot of people to agree on things to get something done in, the, in our government compared to other governments. And uh, that, is a, that is a key obstacle here. Uh, and lastly, I'll um, just mention the trust issue. Uh, any deficit debt reduction package is going to have to be bipartisan because it's going to contain elements that people don't like. And if I'm, if I'm a Republican member of the House, I've got to be able to tell my constituents, you know, I didn't want to raise taxes on businesses or high-income households, but the Democrats insisted, and those guys made, made, made me do it. And the Democrats are going to have to tell their constituents, I didn't want to cut spending, but the Republicans insisted, and that, that was the cost of getting a deal. And so one party can't do it on their own, or they would self-destruct. Uh, so it's got to be it's got to be kind of a hold hands and jump thing. It's got to be a situation where the White House, the president comes in and says, this is an important national issue. Uh, we're all going to have to compromise. You're not going to get everything you want, but look at the big picture. And then if the president provides air cover, then congressmen and senators can actually uh, negotiate. But in the absence of that White House leadership, uh, you're not going to get Congress to do this on their own. They just, that's not how Congress uh, is de designed. Let me mention one last thing, which is public opinion. Uh, you can get people totally riled up about the debt. And they say, we've got to cut the debt. And this is crazy. And then they say, well, do you want to raise taxes? And they say, no. Do you want to cut spending? And they say, no. And they say, well, you know, how are you going to get there from here? Uh, public spending is, is hopelessly conflicted about this. It's totally dependent on framing. And you can get, you can get polls to say anything uh, you want on this topic because there's so many moving parts. There's so many perspectives that, that, that you can offer. So that makes the politician's job harder because there's no clear mandate. Uh, uh, if public opinion could get organized or focused, then there might, that, might actually, that might actually help. So where does this leave us? Um, there's two quotes I really like here. There's two paths we could go on. One is uh, a couple years ago, uh, a couple of members of Congress went on a listening tour to hear how, how they should reform the tax system. And somebody actually said, you should get rid of all the deductions that don't affect me. <laughs> all right? And it's like, that, would be, you know, that would be great. But that's how we got in this problem in the first place. And it's not, that's not how we're going to get out of it. Uh, the other approach is uh, a quote that is commonly attributed to Winston Churchill. But he didn't actually say it. It turned out there was a really politician, Abba Iban, who said the closest thing to this, but no one apparently has actually said this. But it's one of those quotes that has a life of its own. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all their other options. 
and uh, Winston Churchill's biographer uh, said that Churchill definitely believed that, but he never, there's no evidence he ever actually said it. <laughs> so uh, that is the thin read of political hope that uh, I will leave you with. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. What are the relative dimensions of the infrastructure deficit? Is it like the national debt or is it a little item? Uh, the um, American Society of Civil Engineers puts out this annual uh, uh, report every couple of years that talks about, you know, how many roads need to be paved and how many overpasses need to be reconstructed. And uh, it's in the trillions of dollars. Uh, it's big enough that in the book I propose we deal with it over 25 years, let me put it that way. Uh, but it's everything, it's roads, air facilities, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it, it's a big item, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Our current ta tax system favors the wealthy people in this country quite a bit. We have our low rates on dividends and capital gains of just 20 percent. Our employment tax only takes taxes the first $125,000 of earnings. So I recommend uh, tax all earnings with the employment tax. People that are earning five million or 20 million, they would all be paying the same rate as the low income people. And throw the capital gains and dividend tax, that income in with regular income and have it pay taxes at the regular progressive rate that wage earners pay their taxes. This is one of two um, most kind of interesting creative areas of policy right now. Uh, there's a lot of ideas out there about raising taxes on high income, high wealth households. Uh, uh, they range from the things you mentioned, which would hit kind of run of the mill high income households to Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax, which would only hit people with $50, $50 million uh, or higher. I will say there's a big difference uh, uh, between upper middle class and kind of small businessman wealthy and, and uh, you know, Amazon, Microsoft wealthy. We were talking orders of magnitude there. And so um, I think the debate is uh, taking form. People are beginning to understand that. But the notion that we should raise the wealth tax is – so incredibly different from the notion that we should remove the payroll tax cap uh, that that um, uh, uh, there's just a broad range of issues being considered. Some of them I think will happen. I mean, I think there, the taxation of capital gains uh, is a big issue in the country. Right now you can avoid all capital gains taxes on your income if you hold it, if you hold the ass on your assets, if you hold them till death. Very regressive, right, on the low-income people? Yes, uh, no. Um, this is, uh, I'm writing a paper about this right now. A value-added tax uh, can be uh, progressive. It actually hits, it's, it's a, uh, part of it, hit, basically a value-added tax taxes all future consumption. So if you think where does future consumption come from, it comes from future wages, uh, future capital income, with an, with an exception, and existing wealth. So a value-added tax, imposing a value-added tax would be a one-time 10% tax on all existing wealth. And so and it, it would be administered. There's no way to avoid it, unlike Warren's tax. And there's no assessment that has to happen. Yes. Yeah. And so, so it, it has some attractive features as a wealth tax. It has no efficiency cost associated with it. So um, I'm trying to expand this idea in a paper. In a paper. Yes. A couple of weeks ago, the uh, long-term German bonds, 30-year bonds, as you know, were a reverse negative 30 basis points. And some believe that if we aggressively offered 50-year bonds or 100-year bonds, we might not go that low, but we might get a very low rate. Do you see a window? Is there enough demand for these long-term bonds to both lower our average interest rate, uh, which would be a good thing, but also push out the refinancing risk so we're not kind of constantly having to yeah, so that's a great question. We ninety percent of our debt will expire and hence have to be rolled over within ten years. And I'm not sure about a five year number, but it's probably like fifty or sixty percent of, of the debt. So with interest rates low right now, there's been a push to saying let's lock in those low interest rates. 
Um, I'm in favor of doing that on the rolled over stuff. Uh, but if you try to do it on the existing debt, like you try to, if you try to buy back all the existing debt, you're paying a higher price for the existing debt because interest rates are low right now. So you won't gain anything from that. But we could successively roll over uh, debt into longer uh, format. I think that would be good. I, um, the, the, um, the maturity structure of the debt right now is already really long relative to what it has been uh, historically. But I, if, if we can lock in low interest rates, we really help the fiscal issue. And so uh, let me, this shows uh, low, in if, if interest rates stay constant, uh, our interest payments will only rise to three and a half percent of GDP, which is still an all time high, but it's much more manageable than if interest rates go up the way CBO thinks they will, which would put us at 5.6 and you can see ac accelerating. So low interest rates are like the best thing that's happened to the fiscal outlook uh, uh, in decades. And if we can lock it in, I would, I would go for it. So two more questions. Um, yes, sir. Can you talk at all about the litigation process in our economics? My two examples are in the medical practice, someone comes in with symptoms, you apply tests that you think it might be, you miss one, at one in a hundred, you miss somebody and you get sued for $10 million. That's factor one. Factor two is the, the drug prices. I know in Germany, when a drug gets approved for distribution, the, the system takes over the up to 1% adverse reaction that's reasonably anticipated. Here, the drug company has to carry that. So the price of the drug has to have an insurance factor to cover a $10 million judgment. Do you talk about that issue at all? I talk about the first one a little bit in that uh, there's a proposal that um, if one of the, there are various ways to that people have proposed to reduce uh, malpractice and liability concerns. One of them is to say that if a doctor follows uh, the kind of the established medical procedures, uh, when whatever what? diagnostic <coughs> reference there is, uh, that they would not then be subject uh, to uh, lawsuit. Uh, th this is considerably out of my area areas of expertise, which are mainly tax and fiscal policy, but I did touch on that. Health policy, I'll just mention, is uh, by far it was the hardest chapter to write because uh, the health system is so complicated. Yes, ma'am. Um, you, know, you had said earlier that growth and, and human capital uh, won't make as much of a difference because it's the way it's tied into Social Security, right, with increasing wages. And, um, I was curious um, if you studied a little bit about maybe things like the Roth 401k or Roth IRA and an introduction to more policies or benefit structures things where we could start to save out parts of Social Security and supplement it with other vehicles yeah. to influence people to do their own retirement yeah, so that's great. My, as John mentioned, my, besides tax and fiscal, my other area is retirement. So I've actually done a lot of work on this. I think um, uh, Social Security provides 90% uh, uh, of the income for a third of all retirees, 90% or more, and it provides 50% or more of income for two-thirds of retirees. So uh, I would like to see people accumulating more but I would like to see that as what are called add-on accounts rather than uh, uh, substituting for part of Social Security. I don't think uh, we have the luxury of reducing the overall Social Security benefit. So. But yeah, but automatic uh, enrollment in IRAs or uh, 401ks, I think are the right approach to get people more involved in the retirement system. Thank you. So, again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and uh, Bill is generous enough that he is going to be in the forum. There are some books. He will, if you have the book, you can sign it. If you don't have the book, you want to buy it.
he can sign it, uh, and, and then we'll be leaving. This is obviously the really short question, uh, which means a question that like has less than 15 words and takes less than, <laughs> say, 20 <laughs> seconds to answer. So those are what I define as short questions with short answers. Uh, don't mean to be rude, but but we do. We want to get Bill to dinner. He has I mean, he did not have pizza with the students. Uh, he's looking pretty famished. Uh, so we're going to be here about 20 minutes, and then we'll be going to dinner. Thank you very much for coming, and I uh, hope to see you at our next book forum. Thank you.